think I'm going to start with a page that had the video. Honey, yeah. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in. I see familiar faces already joining us, and I'm going to get immediately into the content. But it's good to see Nate and uh, Doug and Elad and Brian and others that I see on here regularly. Please notice the topic. Why 80% of the words on our web page are wrong? Now, I want you to know that that's an interesting claim, and I mean it precisely. I mean at least 80%. And it has to do with the choice of the words, and it has to do with the order of the words. But to solve for the broader question of how we can drive more performance, high converting copy, I'm going to take a route that may shock you. In fact, my next slide is the picture of an Australian athlete. This Austrian, I'm sorry, athlete, triathlete, Nat, uh, Natalie Barilli, I think is how you pronounce it, was assaulted and kidnapped. Now, I'm not resorting to sensationalism. I'm not uh, stretching for an illustration. I want to show you how the words chosen by Natalie led to her escaping a very uh, horrific uh, situation. I want you to understand, and I know this is challenging for you to consider, that Natalie was employing marketing by the definition I use when I'm teaching in this YouTube series. Natalie was taking her kidnapper on a journey that led to a series of conclusions which, which motivated behavior that allowed her to escape the horror that she was uh, confined in. And Natalie's actual story, which I've taken from the BBC, is valuable to every single marketer online here. Now, I don't want to focus on anything dark here or uh, trigger any painful memories for guests uh, in the audience, but I don't want to miss an opportunity to help you transcend our very limited understanding of marketing, moving it up uh, so that we transcend the limitations of its connotations, get to the core of its denotation, and glean today a primary, fundamental understanding of how human beings survive in a social dynamic. You survive in a social dynamic by influencing choice and by making right choices. Each one of you that have joined me are born into a social dynamic. You're in a world which is full of interdependencies. And you may say, wait a second, where does this connect to writing copy? This takes you beneath shallow, mundane, magic words and into the core psychology that enables you to be effective in your work as you are communicating a solution to someone. But it connects to something deeper in the human condition. Each of us are born into a social dynamic where survival is dependent on the actions of other parties. No person, hardly any, perhaps no person, can claim that they are entirely dependent upon themselves. Throughout your life, throughout the moments of your day, you are constantly choosing and you are constantly being chosen. The combination of this uh, choosing uh, sort of uh, process from either end results in the quality of your life. Now, with that in mind, an attacker chose Natalie. This person kidnapped her. I'm holding up a story. We're going to take the story apart and then I already have pages ready. Show us some of the pages. Let me go to the first one. Go to Honeyweb. I did not look at these pages until seconds before I went live. Honeyweb submitted a live op page. They want us to improve performance. I'm glad that you submitted your page, and if you'll scroll down further, uh, sort of show them the page. This is what they have done in terms of communicating. I want you to read some words on that page because I'm going to compare this page's approach with Natalie's approach. In fact, I'm going to make a strong claim. Natalie's approach to marketing, and that is influencing the choices of uh, her assailant, was highly effective and this page, along with others submitted by people in the audience, can grow 
in its effectiveness by learning what Natalie did. So it says at the beginning, are you looking to grow your business using proven online marketing strategies? It asks a question. Then it says, Honeyweb are your local online marketing strategy experts based right here in beautiful Adelaide. And we're not just a specialist, you know, and they go on, we are this and we are that. I want you to think about that copy because we're going to come back to it. And as we come back to it, we're going to learn transferable principles that will influence how we think about all of the work that we're doing in our marketing and collateral and in particular on our websites. Are you with me? Are you ready to understand how these two pieces connect? So I have a simple promise for you today. I want to take this problem of how do I write copy that really produces a difference in performance, high conversion, that gets to a yes. I want to take that question and answer it with this simple promise. What we're going to do is see a pattern that exists in all human relationships. And from that pattern, extract a set of principles that we can apply in the relationship you're creating with a prospective customer. And I'll do that by first of all telling you the story. So here it is in my hand, held up. We printed it and, uh, and I'm just gonna hit the highlights. It's all over the internet, you can find it. This happened in July of 2019. She's an Austrian triathlete. And I'll read a couple of the phrases from it who says she was kidnapped, stripped and threatened with drowning. And not only did she say that, they caught the assailant. So it's not some uh, bogus story. And I won't go into the details yet of her story, except to say, for those of you that feel tension right now, she escaped. And she escaped in a remarkable way. And that way, uh, the methodology she employed is the point of our story. But I'll just go to the last part. She says, thank God I was able to free myself and I'm well, except for a broken arm and a head injury. This guy hit her over the head, knocked her out. She woke up, she, you know, she was unconscious and uh, it's a terrible story, but she woke up tied to a chair, stripped naked. The man poured alcohol down her throat and did other things, threatened to drown her. So please understand that she wasn't dealing with somebody who was just uh, intent on scaring her a bit. This was a serious assault. And everything she said and did from that moment forward, from the moment she regained consciousness, was critical. Indeed, uh, absolutely critical. But Natalie instinctively moved through a process that I've been teaching in here for years, and I want you to understand it as it connects to the webpage we looked at. So to do that, I wanna, I wanna take you to some of the quotes in, uh, the article, words that she said, and then I'm gonna tie those to the key principles. So, the first note, uh, this is sort of the story, is right here in the top. Let's, let's go to that middle piece. These are excerpts from the story pulled out, and I'll tie these together with key points. But notice this, she says she admired them. What, what is that about? Well, somehow, in the midst of the horror she was uh, living, she noticed orchids, and she complimented the orchids. Now, that caused some sort of significant change in the mindset. It was an opening. It was the beginning of personalizing Natalie's relationship to this attacker. It established the opening for a connection to develop. Now, I wanna point out to you that I am trying very hard not to read into the story my own theory, but simply extract a pattern I've seen in story after story like this, and I've seen in relationship after relationship, and which I believe is absolutely material to the relationship between a business and its prospective customer. Because business is not like establishing a relationship, it is establishing a relationship. Relationships are not a metaphor. Relationships are the foundation of every business. So stay with me. Natalie admired them. Now, I want you to notice his response. I have it here in the article, and you can see it all of the sudden. Notice the phrase right there. It's in the middle. All of a sudden, the culprit was nice to me. Now, I want you to notice something. First, you see an attitudinal change. This attitudinal change because she drew attention away from herself and onto his work. 
And he then drew from the complement of his work a sort of personal, uh, I call it here in my notes, a I am response. He told her, I am a gardener. So now, suddenly, the initial attempt at connection established the beginning of a relationship where he translated her compliment of his work into something about his own identity and true to human nature as he proclaimed his identity to her, I am a gardener, he was also beginning to establish a new kind of uh, mindset, a new kind of attitude in his relationship with her. We know now much more about this person, and we know that he had a horrific childhood and uh, his mother was uh, not good to him. She said earlier in the story that he was full of hate. It's likely that his move against her was connected to this. I'm not trying to get into pop psychology, but I'm only bringing that point up because Natalie had to overcome this, this uh, mindset he had towards her and the only way that was going to happen, now listen, this is where it gets very serious and this is the first principle. The only way that was going to happen was if she changed his observation set and established rapport. So if you're following with me in your notes, the first thing that I want you to see is that Natalie built rapport. Now, this is a woman whose life was on the line. She was a new mother. You can imagine what was in her mind. And that is not enough in its own right to save her, but it was the only way it was going to happen. And that's why I want to point out something to you in the beginning, and this is critical. And if you'll stay with me all the way through, because you may not see where this is going, you may properly doubt how I'm constructing it. But wait till we get further in and you can see the whole picture, the whole canvas, and you may see something that is profoundly important to your daily work, even to your personal life. First, I would point out that the observation, and that's a classic component in perception and in psychology and in science, and that is that, that this man's relationship with her was based on his initial observation. Obviously, he chose her, and he chose her uh, with, let's call it, uh, a negative set of intentions. But she had to change what he was observing. She had to get him to see her in a different way. There are techniques for this in relationships, but one is an honest compliment. I don't mean a manipulative fake compliment. I mean an honest compliment, and that's the method she instinctively chose in an effort to survive. So what you need to see that above this rapport piece really is she changed the observation set and the changing of the observation set allowed her to begin to establish rapport. So you should notice, A, the compliment. B, you should notice the implied identity. By complimenting his work, she connected to his identity, which he responded to by suddenly describing himself as a gardener. Can you imagine how surreal that was? This is a, uh, this is a criminal with horrible intentions suddenly describing himself as a gardener. Now, if it stopped there, we might not know this story, and it might have just been a tragedy. But then Natalie proceeded to speak with him in a conversation. So now, under this observation, under this observation slash rapport piece, I want you to notice three things that happened. There was a compliment. There was... There was a appeal to his identity, and finally there was a trust-building conversation. Now you'll see why in just a moment. You'll see why I say it was trust-building. But the three components that led to this rapport is, is the beginning of, of, of Natalie's effort to change his choice set. Are you all following with me? And, uh, and so stay with me and watch what happens next. And by the way, I have been studying a series of these stories and they all have the same exact pattern. I read one recently about an elderly grandmother carjacked and in a terrible situation. 
But before she was done, the carjacker drove her home. Now listen, there's a reason here. Uh, let's take me to the second big shift that occurred. So you're going to notice that there was an observation set which changed. And when it changed, rapport was established. And there are three components of that. A compliment and an appeal to his identity. And then finally, a trust building conversation. I need you to really remember that word conversation and trust building. Later you'll see how it connects to our websites and the problems we have with our attempt to, uh, to treat people in a way that will produce the right outcome for them and for us. So what happens next? Well, she moves from observation to influencing something that happens inside of his mind. What was it? Conclusion sets. Now, I want you to understand the importance of moving from observation to conclusion. What's happening is you're shifting observations in order to produce a different set of conclusions. We all know what his conclusions were prior to this exchange. Prior to this exchange, he had concluded to, let's use the word victimized to be polite. Don't forget, he had hit her, he tied her up, he poured alcohol down her uh, throat, uh, attempted to drown her, he had a broken her arm, etc., etc. And it was just beginning. So she had to shift. And if you for a moment are thinking, why are we using this macabre story? It's not crime. I'm not looking to be sensational. But you learn from the extreme edges. Do you hear me? If you want to understand the psychology as it applies to marketing, move to the extreme edges. That's where truth is often hiding. And from there you can extract the principles that you can tie together into a coherent whole. So, here she is now, and we can start to see the conclusions change. Why? Well, you can see they changed the way, and here comes a critical piece for every person here who's in love with focus groups. You know his conclusions changed, not because he said so in a focus group. Often what you get from a focus group is more confusion than what you started with when you put them together. I watched one of the largest brands in America spend $90 million and destroy value because they built a product around a focus group's ideas. She changed his conclusions and we know this not because of a focus group or his words but because of his deeds. Behavior is the clearest indication of the change in conclusion sets. Do not test at the level of someone's seeming, but test deeper into their doing. All right, so stay with me. So the observations are changing. The conclusion is changing. We can start to see that she, he's beginning to see her in a different light than, than perhaps he saw other women. And we can also see that trust is being established. Now, I'll come back to the conclusion set. I'll show you how we know that. Because what she's trying to do is not simply change his conclusions. And marketer, this is the point that we're all making a mistake in. Okay, listen to me carefully. I don't want to keep going this way. I think I'll, I think I'll write underneath this and just take these three out. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this number one. I'm going to call this number two. And then I'm going to get to the third thing. What she's attempting to do is to influence a decision. Now, if it's a genuine decision, it will be actualized in physical reality. But to get him to decide to free her, she didn't... Do what many of us would do. Now listen to me, because this is what your marketing sounds like. She didn't say, I'm actually one of the kindest human beings you've ever met. I am the leading athlete in my country. I am the leading kind person in my country. She didn't say, you shouldn't do this. It's immoral. It's wrong. She didn't preach. She didn't brag. She didn't declare. Instead, she connected. And what's happening in page after page after page after page, what I see in our copy is this shallow, one-sided, mass of words hurled at the person in the form of 
declarations were the best, were the fastest, were specialists, were good. You can trust us. How many times has someone said to you, you can trust me, and it turned out that you actually could? Have you noticed that the people who you can trust rarely go around telling you, you can trust me? All right, so I would also suggest, th thanks Dave for what you're saying uh, here, because I forget this, and, and it helps the community. Like the video, please. I, I saw this in a chat right now. If you like what we're doing today, please like and subscribe and tell someone, but stay with me. So now, what's happened is, Natalie is proving herself to be a much more effective marketer. Now when I say that, it might be offensive to some, and I'm okay with that. I'd rather offend you and say something that is, uh, has real content, then blend in and homogenize my theory of marketing with the vague nonsense of the masses. Listen to me, marketing is influencing a conclusion. It then influences a decision, which results in a behavior. Marketing is not making lots of claims, and yet that's what our marketing tends to be. We even call them campaigns. We use military words. We call people targets. We say they're leads, so that means they just lead to value for us. Their only worth is what they lead to in our pocketbook. What you have to understand, though, is that marketing is a force that rules the world. Listen to me. Your entire life is influenced by it. You believe certain things about drinking water that was marketed to you by the Gatorade and the fluids in the, 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 the various uh, vendors of, of uh, sports fluids. You believe certain things that are being marketed to you by the different food lobbies. They're all trying to influence your conclusions. And we don't even know how to untangle ourselves. We're so tangled up in the cultural snares that have been set for us. But on the other hand, and this is very important, a person who understands the nature of marketing and uses it in the right way can transform results and impact the world. You're going to see Natalie not just saving her life, but think about the fact she's a mother with a newborn. Think of all the lives that are going to be touched because Natalie does this right. And least, unless you think this is just an anecdote, this is a pattern. Some of you can instantly sense the truth of it. Others may need to go out and study more, but this is a pattern in all relationships. And I want you to learn this because if you learn it, you can do more than earn a paycheck. You can influence the world in positive ways. Think of marketing as a martial art. You say, well, I think it's, it's used too much for bad things. Probably is, but that doesn't make it bad. You know the greatest technology? Maybe the greatest technology thus far invented in the history of mankind? Tell me what you think it is. Take a moment, tell me. I'll come right back to these pieces. There's a reason I'm asking you. Give me what you think is the greatest technology that has so far been given to mankind. Elod says the wheel. That's a good, that's a good, that's a good guess. All right, somebody else. I see the wheel. I'm waiting for another piece. Oh, uh, wait. Yeah, Andrew Layton says writing. Let me stop there for a second. I was listening to, uh, somebody else says fire. This is very good. Somebody says penicillin, very good. I want to tell you that I don't know that there is an answer to this question. There are only opinions, and those are all good answers. But I heard a perplexing answer, one that surprised me not moments ago uh, in my studies. I'm always trying to learn. And I heard a thinker say, the greatest technology invented is the alphabet. Indeed, and this was their argument, and the alphabet has been used to condemn people to death. The alphabet has been used to, to commit horrors. I mean, Hitler sent messages with the alphabet that caused the deaths of millions. But the alphabet has been used to save lives all over the earth. Marketing is neither good nor bad. Marketing is a martial skill that you can use to do good if your motivations are so. In Natalie's case, she is literally marketing. She's She's changing this man's conclusions about her and hoping to change his decision and thus his behavior. So what happens on the decision side? I want you to notice, go back to the uh, copy if you would. So notice this. I made a suggestion to the man. Wait a second. Did you notice something? She didn't make a demand. She didn't say, let me go. 
Notice how she's fostering a conclusion. Let's say it was an accident. That's her exact words. Let's say it was an accident. Now, what she's attempting to do is something I've taught in the past, and since uh, I'm going to break it down for you, I will also show you what I've been teaching you so far in the slides. I'll just stop at these two. I'm going to go to the board, and I'm going to draw something that explains what's going to happen next, because it is not one decision she must earn. He does not decide, I will let her live. He actually makes a series of micro decisions. So I've often taught that the funnel should never be presented the way we normally do because people don't fall in, they fall out because gravity isn't working for you, it's working against you. And the only way to represent what the marketer really has to do is this. Most people are, ex are exiting our funnel. We have got to not drive them up, but attract them up the funnel with the power of our value proposition, which is at the center of our message. I've also suggested to you that people do not go up the funnel in one jump, but they go up in tiny micro yeses. A headline has two micro yeses. We're gonna look at your pages in a moment. We will ground this. I'm almost done with this story, and I'm gonna look at your pages and, and take what we've been learning and cash it in in the uh, everyday, ordinary work of our life. But first of all, I'd like to point out that Natalie says the first thing he got him to do was to cut the tape. This is what had her tied to the chair. Then he allowed her to get dressed. Wait a second, are you seeing what's going on here? She has now influenced his conclusion set. And I would point out that, that the trust building conversation has repositioned the relationship between him and her in this person's mind. And in doing so, she now starts to win a series of micro -essays. She doesn't demand to be let go. She doesn't do what most of us do in our copy. She makes a suggestion. And then step by step, micro yes by micro yes, she starts to get to her desired behavior. What does he do next? Get this. He puts her in his car and drives her all the way to the front door of her house. Now, stop for a moment. I got to tell you something very important because this is right at the point where many marketers drop the ball, so to speak. We think that because we got in the cart or we got in the car, it's over. But I can guarantee you that she continued to build trust in that automobile all the way to the front door because she was not free yet. She is still in a stranger's car who has already overpowered her once. But ultimately, those micro yeses led to the final words of this story, to its climax as I hold it up. Waiting at home was her 14 week old son. Between her and that child was an indescribable chasm that had to be crossed. It was in that final step where he let her leave the confinement of the car and step into the safety of her home that she actualized the entire culmination of this process that it resulted in the winning behavior. Does this make sense? Somebody said he could have called an Uber. The truth is, who knows in those situations, she probably was working so hard to keep his attention and to keep him from suddenly getting violent. I doubt she had many options other than those that she took, but I wasn't there. All I know is, at a practical level at least, Natalie is alive because she did something almost the opposite of what most of us do in our daily work. She didn't, she didn't scream loudly about her value. She didn't make lots of declarations. She didn't make pretentious claims. She didn't she didn't try to moralize and, and, and tell him what he should and shouldn't be doing. She established an authentic uh, conversation. I'm sure the conversation itself was authentic. You know her goals. Her goal was to escape a madman. But the way she did it was employing a relationship-building set of activities in a way that always 
produces, a, a, let's say stochastically produces a better result. So let's walk through those steps for a second and then we're going to look at pages. Uh, Natalie, I don't know where you are today in the world, but we all congratulate you. We're grateful that you're safe. We're grateful that you've been reunited with your family and we admire how you managed uh, this situation. You're a model to all of us. But I want to talk now about those steps. I saw a web page at the beginning of this broadcast. In that web page, I saw an observation set. These were the uh, signals that you put on that page in the form of uh, the alphabet. Those letters on that page arrange themselves in a certain way along with some images, the job of which is to bring you a new customer. But they really should be following a pattern that's identical to the one outlined in my slide. Let's go to the slide and, uh, and stay there for a little bit. First, you've got to connect, and that connection has two key pieces, but it establishes the beginning of rapport. Without rapport, the person's guard is up, and you can't get through their defenses. From that new observation set that produces that connection, you're going to have an opportunity to dialogue, and in that dialogue, you can influence conclusions. If you influence it so that the right conclusions are arrived at, then the behavior becomes inevitable. The conclusions power the decision, and the decision powers the behavior. Observation, conclusion, decision, behavior. There's more to this. I've taught about the role of expectations elsewhere. I won't get into it now. I've taught about a cycle called the trust trial elsewhere. I won't get into it now. Instead, I want you to think about these points, and we're going to shift to a web page. But let me just ask you before I move to that web page and begin to tackle it through this lens. Is this making sense to you? Are you following how we've used this story to establish some fundamental principles that transcend the actual situation that Natalie was in, but connect to all sorts of places in our life where people are making decisions around us? Good. Those yeses are important. I really, when I ask you these questions, it's sincere. I'm trying to calibrate. All right. So now I'm going to I'm going to take you right over to the first web page that we looked at. You submitted this web page. By the way, look, info at mechlabs.com. Send us some more. Send us a page if we can get to it today. Sometimes we don't get to it on this one. We do it on another one. I think the page I'm looking at right now, I don't even know if it was submitted for today, but it was submitted by someone, and we're going to use it. So take me to, there you go. Scroll up. Good, yeah, make sure I can see... The, Make it a little small, just a little bit smaller on that giant screen so I can see it over here on their screen. It's just right. Let's start with the top. All right, so what you're looking at is not a web page. Uh, you've heard me teach this, but think of it now as a signal set. In light of this story, think of it as a signal set. It's a series of signals designed to stimulate something in the mind. It's just zeros and ones in a binary system that turns on pixels. And so the pixels have been arranged in such a way as to put an image in front of me, a giant video. And uh, I don't know if it's a mistake that it's yellow with no shape behind it, but if it doesn't really have a picture behind that play button, and it might be where it's paused. Uh, it, otherwise, basically, you're betting on the fact that you're going to create rapport and connection with me with this video. That's the first mistake I would say this page has. Video is powerful and can be used to establish all sorts of powerful connections, but if you begin with it, you're dependent on me playing it and listening to a certain point before anything happens. And I might not even be in an environment where I can play that video right now or look at it out loud. And in fact, I may want to scan in high speed enough text to determine whether or not I'd invest the time to click on a video, wait for it to load and listen to it. When you put that video in front, right or wrong, maybe you're right. Most of my tests, I'll tell you it's wrong. But maybe in this case it's right. But when you lead with that video, big, large, in my face, dominant, I may never see the text below. In fact, uh, on some monitors, all you'll see is the video and maybe two lines of text. More importantly, here's what you're saying. This is your hypothesis. And I want to say this to every person who may be new to my teaching here. You're, all your pages have a hypothesis. You may just not know what it is, but it's a mistake not to know it and not to be intentional about it. Your page has an implied hypothesis if it doesn't have an overt carefully intended hypothesis. And the hypothesis here is that if I stick this video at the beginning of the relationship, 
I'm going to get more people into the text below and into a, into a genuine, uh, you know, customer relationship with me. That's a big, giant risk, and it's probably wrong. Now, but let's take the video out of the equation, and let's look at the first words we encounter. It says, are you looking grow? I think the word two is missing, and I've made mistakes like that uh, my whole life, so we won't draw down on that, but just as a courtesy, you may want to get the missing word in that headline. Are you looking to grow your business using proven online marketing strategies? I, I just, I want you to think for a second and ask yourself a question. When you came to this webpage, let's just close your prospective customer. Empathy is the marketer's most important skill. So all of you right now, if, you, if we wanna help you to grow in your website, I need you to get empathetic. Instead of being a third party, listening to me speak, can you please suddenly become a customer? Let's go full screen uh, for a while, Cliff, while we just work on this, thank you. But I want them to look at this as a prospective customer. Now, you have to imagine what's in my mind when I came to this page. Obviously, I have a problem to solve or I wouldn't be investing the time. Now, the first thing I would say is, when you ask me to invest energy here, what am I trying to do? Well, if you go back to our diagram, don't go there right now. Remember, we need to establish rapport. So how many words are in that top line? Somebody count them. Tell me how many words are there. Are you looking? Count them and give us the number. Okay. Now, are you looking to grow your business using proven online marketing strategies? I'm trying to get a number. 11. Now, let me ask the audience another question. Do those 11 words give me any meaning? Do they help in any way answer the question that I came with? And there should be 12, says Davey, right? Uh, the reality is no. All they do is state the question. Now, is there any value? Maybe it's the question that's on my mind. But candidly, you only have 11. That's a huge ask. You've asked, you're buying my attention with those words. That's all you can, you understand? In the beginning, all you're trying to do is sell attention. You're, you're not even selling a customer yet. You've got to get enough attention to get a connection. And when you start with the question, are you looking to grow your business using proven online marketing strategies? If I read all of that, you've worn out my account. Many people, that's all you get from me. And that's not enough. You didn't communicate meaning. And so I can go to option B. And that's the back button from that great casino in the sky we call Google. Go to the text underneath it. Honeyweb are your local online, that should be is, I know it sounds like it's a plural because you have experts, but the subject and the predicate don't agree properly, but stay with it. Uh, scroll back up, the Honeyweb, I can't see it. We scroll down too far. Honeyweb are, there it is, are your local online marketing strategy experts based right here in beautiful, I think it's Adelaide. Um, now, once again, what do you have here? Somebody persona, as a, a, you've got to be a customer, and if you're uh, a marketer and you submitted this page, there's no way I want to be harsh on you. Uh, when I sound harsh, it's because I'm, I'm becoming a prospective customer, and they're quite jaded, as we all are when we're shopping and being inundated with messages that are most of the time not even true. I want you to notice now that I've invested three lines, and what have I learned about you? Well, I know you're local, and I know that that city is, uh, in your mind, beautiful. But how is that helping solve my problem? And how is that drawing any Drew connection with me? The fact that your local might have some value, but if that's all that's been established with all of the energy you're asking me to invest, you're not getting close to what we had to do in the story with Natalie. Connections not being established. I mean, I'm gonna use, I'm a little scared about what I'm gonna do next, but I'm gonna do it. Uh, I, I really, I'm, I'm scared of what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna go back to Natalie's story. I'm gonna go full screen on the text again. I'm gonna ask yourself, what if Natalie had begin with, go full screen. Are you looking for a new friend? Or some, I could go further and further with that point. What if she'd asked a question like that? Do you think that would have established connection? What if she said that she was a, an expert in something or made a claim about her person? Would that have established connection? No, the story might have ended very differently. Natalie started by very carefully and very quickly drawing attention to this person and to their needs and to their work. In fact, the word admired is a key word in that sentence. And then look at 
the third text. We're not just a specialist. So now we're bragging. That really statement says, I'm not, what that means is I am a specialist and that's not all, I'm even more. Now, marketer, all that may be true. And again, I'm on your side, but the prospective customer is wading through drivel. The technical word I'll call it today is drivel, D-R-I-V-E-L. And what I mean is that's that 80% that I said is all over the internet and it's hurting us. It's not going to provide conversion because it is not establishing the pattern in successful relationships and behavioral influence that we saw in the story we opened with. Instead, and by the way, I didn't cherry pick this. This was the first one that came up, first one that I saw. Uh, I didn't go on the internet and look for a bad example. This is all over the internet. And the reason we see so much of it is because we're all copying each other instead of thinking for ourselves. Uh, marketers, are you seeing the problems that I'm talking about? We're going to go to another page. I am, again, if you make some changes uh, and uh, you're the marketer who submitted this page, reach out to us and, and we may give you some more commentary. We want to help you, not hurt you. But honestly, so far, this page is so far off the mark, you have to start completely over if you want to get the kind of result that we're talking about today. It makes the point of this thesis that we began with, and that is that most of our words are being wasted. And that's the problem with so much of our copy. Let's go to another site. Is it helpful for you to look at the sites? Are you liking to do this? I know some of my audiences like, like this, but I moved into a very sort of a practical space now. So let's, let's, let's look at this site. Uh, I might optimize this just to stay there. You're in the right location. I love that area. And uh, if you're online right now, uh, congratulations. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful area and I'm sure it's a beautiful resort. But I want to stay right on the home page, full screen. Okay? All right, now, there's a picture and those pictures might be the right thing to do in a situation where you want people to be attracted to the location. But the problem with the pictures are they don't matter until I have connection. They should be there in their own way, but the most important thing you need to do with me is put the observation set in front of me that's going to help me establish connection. And then in the trust building conversation, you're going to have to communicate your value proposition so that I believe it, achieve four conclusions, make a decision followed up by my behavior. When I see this, the, 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 the attractiveness of the image changing beneath white text on those images and it's small white serif text, makes it very difficult to read or understand. Your go-to place in the Colorado mountains is the, one of the ones I'm looking at, it changes. Pa I wish I could pause it there. What does that mean? How does that in any way start to establish connection with me? Why does that phrase matter? In fact, you could go back to, to the opening line on the last web page, that question, or you could take this. Let's just take this for a moment. You could put those words on any other location and say that, and it could be a plausible claim, your go-to place. You could put that on 10 more resorts in the same area, or you could just change the name of the area and use it all over the world. Is it establishing any meaning? Is it doing something that's going to start to change the nature of my relationship with you? The answer is no. Underneath it is a button that doesn't really make a lot of sense our rooms. Now, it does make a lot of sense to the person who designed the site because they're looking at this through the eyes of a company. They're employing company-centric logic, but customer-centric logic is the key. So let me ask you a question. What happens when I click that button? Do you tell me about availability? Do you show me what your rooms cost? Do you show me just more pictures of your rooms? Because I'm looking at pictures behind this. What happens when I click on that button? And why should I click on that button? Do I know enough information that I care yet? What we haven't done here is thought about where they are in the, in the buyer's journey, in the sequence of thought, with the necessary micro yeses that we talked about here in order to making the decision. I'm gonna use a, a, a crass but apt example. You couldn't get Natalie to the front door of her house before she got untied from the chair. There is a process, there is a sequence, and she had to move logically through the sequence in order to finally step into safety. And what you've done here is you've ignored that sequence. You've just picked the terminus point. And then you've put on the button a sort of meaning 
uh, deprived phrase, our rooms. First of all, it starts with the word our. They don't care about you, they care about themselves. Our may simply mean to you, I'm talking about my hotel's rooms, but it, to the other person, you're already beginning with the wrong end of the relationship. I hope this is helping you. Once again, I'm not trying to hurt you, but you need to redesign this so that all that space is doing a better job of establishing the initial relationship that will lead to the right conclusions and thus decisions and thus behavior. All right. Now, let's go beneath it for just a moment and we might slip to another one depending on our time. All right, welcome to Georgetown Mountain Inn. Now you're getting somewhere. But how many of you right now are finding it hard to read that font on the white? It's very hard in here for me. My first problem is that's a lot of text. It's very thin. It has too many lines. It has no bold font in it. It's too much work to get to the meaning. You cannot make it hard for me to understand what I need to know in order to establish a relationship where I'm barely vested. And frankly, I am so barely vested at this point in the relationship. I barely, it's like meeting someone in a bar after work and they've said two words to you. It's not time to go into your thesis. There is a logical progression. And now I have this huge paragraph full of proper words and, and, and difficult to read and without an eye path. Now you do something right underneath it. You give me three bullet points. Beautiful mountain views, good. Excellent home style hospitality, good. Affordable rates and a wide variety of rooms, good. But every one of those things are claims. The only evidence might be in the photographs. There's no evidence about the price and there's absolutely no value proposition. Do you hear me? No value proposition. Because guess what? In that town, or at least in that area, I don't know about the town, there are other places that have beautiful mountain views with a cozy, relaxing alpine atmosphere and excellent homestyle hospitality and affordable rates. So why should I choose you instead of them? Where is the answer to that? Because I am now way too far vested into this conversation without getting the main reason you need to communicate for me to keep investing my energy in the relationship. Do you follow the logic? I'm going to stop there. I hope it's helping you. What I want you to see is that there's a direct comparison between Natalie's story and between what we're talking about now. This is the way all relationships and choice, the way relationships that, that are established, particularly those that engage high levels of choice. Now, any relationship involves choice. But we're trying to get someone to make a major change. And so it requires us to move through this process that we've been describing from the story of Natalie. Let's go to another page. We're almost out of time. I hope this is helping you. This is the Emily Shane Foundation Presents Butterfly Magic. All right, someone submitted this. An entertaining and happy event for all. Save the date. Okay. Um, I want to help you, and I know you're a not-for-profit, and I, I, I don't know if I can help you at all with this page, because I don't know who knows what butterfly magic is. Because right now, what you have done, I'm going to summarize the page, and it's sort of like this. I meet a stranger, I ask you to get on a plane with me and fly somewhere. I don't tell you where, I don't tell you why, I don't tell you what's going to happen when we get there but I expect you to get on the plane because I provide you with all the details. Here's the ticket, here's you know, all the things. The details don't matter until I've made the decision that you matter and then that your offer matters. Now, I'll bet you the Emily Shane Foundation is doing something wonderful in the world, but I can't tell from this page. And I can't tell why butterfly magic should matter to me. And saying it's entertaining and a happy event for all almost hurts you because it sounds so trite. The reality is, there's no meaning, there's just details. I see this with events all the time. You know why some groups get away with it? Because the brand is big. A university can do this, they do this all the time with their classes, horrible communication, but you've got the big brand behind it and maybe a famous professor. Brand covers a multitude of sins. But in a case like this, if this is a local event and everybody knows who you are and everybody know, knows what butterfly magic is and no one needs to understand more, maybe this page would work. But in any situation, that's normal for a marketer. All we've done here 
is major on minors and minor on majors. And that's a surefire recipe for a conversion disaster. All right, I am out of time. I uh, hope you found today helpful. I wanted to give you something like this today because I felt last week, uh, you know, we got into that complexity uh, regarding um, how we spend our budgets. And I thought, let's get really, really down to the essential components that power those spends. And that's the reason we chose this topic. If you like today, please uh, say uh, like and please, uh, please help us grow the audience. Talk to somebody about it. And just know that I'm grateful, absolutely grateful. There's relationships that are, you know, over the years, uh, like David's becoming a good friend and I've, I've exchanged information with Yakov and I'm looking at Dave Fogel. He's on here all the time. And Arlene, it's great to have you on here again. And, and Stephen Parnell, and I saw some nice words from you, Stephen. Uh, uh, I really appreciate that. And so uh, let's keep connecting and let's keep building our relationship and let's do something meaningful with our marketing. Thank you.